Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Welcome to An Architecture, episode 15. In this episode, I was interviewed by Danilo Cuellar of the Peaceful Anarchism podcast. He had heard Joe and I on the Tom Woods show, which you can hear on our episode 8, Tom Woods episode 802, and he liked our approach to talking about libertarianism and some of the ideas we had about the built environment. So he reached out to us and we set up this interview. We recorded this episode back in spring of 2017, and that was around the time that we were doing the, our Patrick Schumacher series. So we haven't really had a chance to do all the editing and everything else we needed to do to get this thing ready to go. But now we finally had a chance to get back to it. And this actually dovetails nicely to the end of our our previous series, which was talking about private ownership of public space. Um, Even though this interview happened before I did my Porkfest speech, which you can hear in our last two episodes, 13 and 14, you'll hear that I was starting to think about some of those ideas in this interview. And we really get into more of the nuts and bolts of what it could mean for cities and infrastructure if we do transition to more of a privately owned, stateless society. This was a fun conversation. As you'll hear, Danilo's got a good sense of humor, uh, and we covered a lot of ground. He was grilling me on on quite a few topics here. We were all over the board on topics related to the built environment, including libertarians colonizing the moon, private ownership of public space, why the 90s were a joke, how I became a libertarian— We touch a little bit on the scales framework that we talked about in our first three episodes. We talked about national defense and, in a sense, how having all of this government-owned property creates kind of a honeypot for invading entities who want to try to take it all over. We went through a list of different types of infrastructure and utilities, such as power, roads, water distribution, sewage disposal, and talked about how all of those things could be provided and possibly better provided through private forms of ownership. We also talked about preservation of parks and green spaces and open spaces and other types of public space and how private ownership of some of these spaces could potentially create stronger protections for preserved areas. Finally, we talked about government roads and how private ownership of roads could potentially make them much safer and mitigate traffic issues. Now, since this was a live interview, there were a few points I made where I was throwing out some statistics or a reference to an article. And of course, at the time, I couldn't remember you know, the exact numbers or the exact reference. So as the episode goes along, we'll patch in some corrections and updates to some of the references that I was making. I want to thank Danilo for taking an interest in us here at Architecture and for taking the time to speak with me on his podcast. Hopefully, you'll all go over and check him out. He has a few other projects he's working on as well. So here's your host, Danilo Cuellar, on the Peaceful Anarchism Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT NoGov license. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I have, I'm terribly excited to have Tim Brochu, who is coming in from Cambridge, England, He's an architect, a libertarian, and the co-host and co-founder of An Architecture podcast that he also does with his twin brother, Joe, who's, uh, who's doing it from Australia. So they are the, uh, the, the ultimate duo. <laughs> <laughs> Joe calls it the, most, the world's most antipodal podcast, meaning that we're on the opposite ends ah, of the globe from each other. I like that. I like that. Very good. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it requires a lot of uh, coordination for, for that collaboration. It does, yeah. That's why it takes us so long to put an episode out. Yeah, so, <laughs> because... so don't complain, all right? Don't complain. They're doing the best they can, all right? Yeah, we need all the stars to align for us to get. It's like trying to land a space shuttle. you got to get that window when you can actually <laughs> land right. it, right? <laughs> 
So just be happy when they do release one, all right? So yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a miracle of nature. So, <laughs> so they uh, feels like it. Their web, their website is anarchitecturepodcast.com. and you can find them on Facebook and Twitter uh, under Anarchitecture Podcast. And we're going to talk about his uh, path to libertarianism, um, the history of his podcast, why they founded it, and what why they believe it's important, important contribution to um, libertarianism and anarchism. And it may be going to a little bit about what the built environment is and, and the non sequitur that most people make, which is like, because we have civilization and we have organization, we got these pipes, we got these electrical lines, we got all these things. That's because of the state. And if you don't like the state, that means you hate all that stuff, <laughs> which is a completely absurd <laughs> notion. So he's going to be happy to debunk that. And also he's a, um, a de facto homeschooler and unschooler or world schooler, as he likes to put it. So we'll uh, get his input on that. So, uh, Tim, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Danilo. Yeah, no problem. I, I heard about you first from uh, Tom Woods, and I uh, thought you guys are doing some really awesome stuff. I think um, this is a very unique perspective on libertarianism and anarchism that most people do not really get. I think it's just awesome that all of these, all of us, you know, content creators, we come at it from a slightly different vantage point and we give our own personal flavor and it just makes it so much yeah. more rounded and um yeah it just adds beauty and depth to our philosophy so uh yeah but it's it's nice nowadays that you can have that there's enough of a, of a base audience out there who is kind of on board and, and understands the fundamentals that we're talking about that you can start to specialize in some of these more specialized topics like for us to build environment for you peaceful parenting unschooling homeschooling all that kind of stuff. So it's nice that you know you don't have to spend every every episode explaining the non-aggression principle over again. You can <laughs> <laughs> you can just start with that and then work into more more specific topics. So. Right. That and the and the jokes are important too. You know, we got to make it we got to make it palatable. It's all about the jokes. <laughs> it's all, all about, about the, the jokes. jokes. Yeah. <laughs> right. If we're not having fun doing what we're doing, why are we doing it? Right. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I heard a couple of your episodes, um, uh, what is it, the introduction and then episodes one to three, and, uh, and you talk about um, yeah, the built environment and scales and scales, what did you say, time and scales as, as it relates yeah, to we, right? we kind of, the, the way we, we first conceived of the podcast was those first three episodes are kind of our, our manifesto. Mm. Uh, we call them our, our foundation series. And we spent the first episode talking about what the built environment is. And the way that we describe that is that you can think about it in terms of different scales. So you have kind of the personal scale of your home. You have the community scale of a neighborhood. You have the, the scale of the city and the management that happens there. And then you have, you start to think about broader kind of development patterns and broader regions. And then ultimately, of course, the whole globe. And so you can think about the built environment from all of those perspectives. And what we want to do is to try to understand uh, how government action and government intervention has influenced the development of the built environment as it exists today and how that could change, how if we move to something closer to a stateless society, how had all that stuff happened? You know, the age old question of who's going to build the roads and not just the roads, but your public parks, other public spaces, public utilities. And there are a couple of ways to think about that. One is there's a question of if you're starting from scratch, you know, if all the libertarians go to the moon and want to start building a society, mm. um, how does that work? How do you get that infrastructure? How do you develop that from scratch based on libertarian principles? But of course, the problem we have nowadays is that there is all this infrastructure out there that's owned and managed by the state. So how do we define a process of divestiture where, where that existing infrastructure and property could ultimately be divested to more of a voluntary type of society? But Tim, I think you're forgetting one thing. You know, if we were to try to colonize the moon, the only way to do that would be to steal money from productive individuals, right? And give it to less... <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way things can happen. Come on. Oh, come on. You're, you're shooting down all my hopes and dreams. <laughs> that was the only plan I had was to go to the moon and start over. You're just a utopian idealist. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> you had a really long ladder. Have you read the the book, uh, the Walter Block books, which like he wrote one on uh, privatization of the roads and uh -huh. a recent one, privatization of oceans, like rivers, lakes, streams, waterways. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't read his whole books. I've listened to a, a number of his lectures and things on on a lot of those topics. And I, Joe, I know, has, has dug a bit deeper into some of his stuff mm. on that. But yeah, he's I don't always agree with him, but I always love seeing how he makes his arguments about some of those things. He's very thoughtful about and very creative about the way that he resolves you know, the hard questions of libertarianism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I heard the um, on the Tom Woods episode when he was talking about the book about privatization of the waterways and... He was basically saying that it would be much better taken care of. It would be less waste. It would be less over harvesting of fish. People have a reflexive contempt for the idea of owning things. You know, how can you own a piece of of the water? How can you own a fish or a hoop of fish? Or you know, how can you own a whale? How can you own these things? And really, that's really the best way to protect it and to secure it is when people have you know their own personal self interest involved in the equation. And Mm -hmm. most people, when they own something, they don't want to just destroy it. They want to maintain it. They want to take care of it, right? And, you know, just the same thing as on land would apply with the ocean or owning a pond. You know, I thought that was interesting. You know, multiple ways you can use a pond, like for recreation or for dumping. But then if you you do use it for dumping, then it's hard to bring it. You can't really (laughs) clean it up and use it for recreation. So, it's got to be, you know. So, 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 all these things come into play. And I love that approach of finding these kind of answers because too many people seem to think oh the government should do that the government should do that oh what should we yeah. do oh, the government should do that <laughs> like that doesn't, that doesn't really take too much thought and too much creativity <laughs> for a solution like that yeah of course right <laughs> yeah people think like you're you're being naive and kind of simple by saying that oh markets will just solve things you know but of course the most naive and simple answer is to say that oh government will just solve it let's just turn it over to government and they'll solve it and of course that's often problematic there are often unintended consequences and often even the intended consequences aren't ideal. <laughs> right. it, it makes winners and losers out of everybody. And, and as you say uh, in your podcast, it just it creates more problems for them to deal with and justify their own existence. Yeah. And getting back to you, your point about privatizing waterways and privatizing things in general, you know, I think one thing that's worth mentioning is that when we talk about privatizing things like a road or like a park, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to take something that's now kind of a public asset. And I say public, I don't mean necessarily government, right. but something that is available for public use and right. public benefit. When you privatize something, let's say a park, that doesn't mean that you're just going to take that park and turn it over to some, you know, greedy capitalist. And then he gets to say who gets to go into the park and who doesn't. When we start to think about ideas of divestiture, I think you have to start to think about ways of preserving what is now essentially a public use, a public benefit. You know, I think that when we think about the concept of homesteading, which is a way that that libertarians tend to see property coming into ownership as you take a piece of unowned property. There's a phrase mixing your labor with the land, whether it's, you know, you find some farmland or find some land and turn it into a farm or even just fencing in property. There are uh, a lot of people, a lot of libertarians have put forth ideas about what are appropriate ways to homestead property. And I think that if we think about public property, I think that you can make an argument that things like public parks, even things like roads have been homesteaded for public use. In other words, even though they've been created by the government in our current society, there is certainly precedent of roads and parks being used by the public. And I think that any divestiture process has to recognize that and has to find a way to turn these assets over to ownership that maintains, at least maintains public use, if not a form of public ownership. And I guess, and I think there are a number of ways it could happen, but I guess my idea is that you could have any number of trusts, you know, there are, there are already nowadays there are land trusts, you know, for things like preserving farmland, you might have an organization that gets together and then they will buy up or have donated property that's existing farmland and then that gets preserved in perpetuity as existing farmland. I, there's certainly ways that, that you could create trusts or even for-profit corporations that could become receivers of these assets, but those organizations might be open to essentially allow anybody to join them as an owner. And then as an owner, they might have anybody who joins would have maybe both the benefit of, of any profits that come out of that. If it's something like a road, you know, and there's a way to, to monetize that the owners might have might benefit from the profit of that, but they would also be responsible for the costs of it. So again, something like a road, if somebody says, yeah, I want to be part of that road ownership corporation, then that's fine. They get the benefits of that if, if it is profitable, but then they're also going to be responsible as an owner, just like any shareholder in any company, for the costs that are incurred by that. So it essentially becomes 
It takes these public assets and puts them into the marketplace of profit and loss where their value can be discovered and where they can, you know, where the more worthwhile projects, the more worthwhile infrastructure can be supported by the market could become available for for different kinds of development that might be more appropriate. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Good. So we already uh, got into the meat. <laughs> let, yeah. let, let me just backpedal yeah. a little bit and sure. we'll talk about your path to libertarianism and how the podcast got started and why you guys created it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I um, I guess growing up, I was always kind of politically apathetic. You know, I grew up in the 90s when the big issues of the day were yeah, a stained dress and an, an ex-football player in a, in a freeway chase. You know, these were like the, the, the big topics of, of the <laughs> 90s, <dangerous>. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I even oh, like, man. you know, when I was in college, um, I remember like Al Gore came oh, during man. the 2000 presidential campaigns and, and, and spoke at my college. And like the big issue that he was promoting was like the airline passenger bill of rights. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, really? This is like what I'm supposed to care about? And, you know, that combined with I grew up on shows, watching shows like Seinfeld, The Simpsons, you know, Beavis and Butthead, where it's this kind of comedic nihilism about <laughs> about the world, you know. <laughs> and so I, I kind of came away from that decade as I was into college, thinking that the world wasn't something that needed to be taken seriously, that it was the world was there to be kind of laughed at and, and possibly <laughs> ignored. And, <laughs> and yet you didn't have to really, really pay too much attention to it. And then in, in my last year of college, 9-11 happened. Mm. And that was, I think, for me, a, a wake up call. I wasn't, unfortunately, very directly affected by it. But I think at that point, I said, OK, you know, I, 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 I probably should start paying a little more attention to, to what's happening out there in the world, especially as I was then leaving college, getting into the real world, getting a job, starting to make some money, get, get a 401k, starting to think about investment and things like that. So I started getting a little bit interested in, in economics and finances and things like that. But I remember at first, you know, of course, there was 9-11 and then there was the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And at the time I was I remember watching when it first started, you know, CNN, you have like the first person view of you sitting on a tank driving through the desert. And I remember watching that and being kind of exhilarated, being like, wow, this is amazing. It's like I'm witnessing history here. You know, we haven't. I think, again, through the 90s, you, you weren't the 90s didn't feel like you were a part of history, you know, <laughs> like the, the whole decade kind of seemed like a joke to me. Um, but a, a bad joke, a bad joke. <laughs> but, but, you know, now all this stuff was happening, 9-11, the invasion of Iraq, where, where this all felt very important, you know, and I started listening in, you know, maybe some right wing radio and, and I kind of bought the all the weapons of mass destruction stuff, kind of hook, line and sinker. And I was, mm. I was at the time all for it as so, you know, mm. go, go get those bastards, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard, I heard someone, I think this was in college. Somebody said it, but it stuck with me that they said that our generation has had three villains or three people that we perceive as, as true villains, right? There's Adolf Hitler, there's Darth Vader, and there's Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and so at this point, I was like, I was like, yeah, if I go get him, he's a bad guy, you know, go, go, go take care of him. Right. Um, but then, of course, that started to drag on. And, and as I started to read a little more and educate myself a little more, I became that enthusiasm waned pretty quickly. And then I actually I think the real catalyst for me was it was around 2003 to 2004. Um, I was working in New Hampshire at the time, which is where I grew up. And on AM radio, there was a show called Against the Grain, and the host was Gardner Goldsmith. I don't know if you know Gardner, but he does. He's he's done some stuff with Brett Fanad on, on School Sucks. Mm -hmm. um, but for a while, he had, and I think it was off and on over the years, but he had this AM radio show where he was putting out these real kind of libertarian ideas. So that was the first I was really exposed to this kind of brand of libertarianism. And I think one thing in particular that caught my attention was he was interviewing somebody about the topic of, of education. Of course, he was saying, you know, we shouldn't have government schools, government shouldn't be running the schools, all the stuff that I've kind of come around to these days. Uh, but at the time, this was, you know, kind of blew my mind. I'm like, how can you say this? Like, I understand criticizing government, but of all the things in government to criticize, like, isn't public schooling, isn't that one of the best things that government does? You know, mm -hmm. they're not hurting anybody there. Right. And so, so that really got my wheels turning. I started digging a little bit. I went online and at this time I was 
it was early in my career. I was had a lot of days where I'm kind of sitting at my computer working on, you know, architectural details, drawing toilet toilet room plans and things like that. <laughs> and I was, I was looking for, I was kind of hungry for audio content. I would listen to music and stuff, but I, yeah. I started getting into more just kind of, this was in the days before podcasts too. Mm-hmm. So I started digging around and finding some audio content. Um, I remember finding a, there was a Harry Brown lecture that I had found on, I think it was on fee.org, Foundation for Economic Education. That was, again, another kind of thing I had heard that got my wheels turning. And then I got into, you know, Fee had a lot of audio content in those days. The Independent Institute was one I liked that had a number of, these were mostly kind of public presentations or public lectures that they had recorded and posted on their websites. Mm -hmm. There were a handful of sites like that. Free Domain Radio, Stefan Molyneux, I, I had gotten into for a little bit. Free Talk Live, I was into for a while. Um, then I get into Mises.org, and I just devoured that's everything. It. You were, it was done. done. Yeah, that's, that's, that's for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I then I was you know I was sold on it at that right. point. So yeah, and the rest I guess the rest is history. Nice. And what about the the podcast? So how did that how did that get started? So well, first of all, so Joe, so I can I I think came to these ideas before Joe did. I think he started getting more interested in these ideas around uh, probably 2008, the financial crisis. I'm sure I've had him some ideas over the years, but at that point, I kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I had done like a little write up at one point about like my take on the on the financial crisis, and I had sent it to him, and so that got him interested in some of these ideas about Austrian economics and and libertarianism in general. And he was, I think he was a bit, he had like read a, a bunch of Ayn Rand stuff back in the day. So he was somewhat, I don't know if he's a big Ayn Rand fan, but, but he, he had at least had that kind of priming, you know, for these kind of libertarian ideas. So I think that probably had something to do with it. But this was also around the time of the first Ron Paul campaign. So, mm-hmm. so there was a lot of excitement at that time around libertarian ideas in general. And I think that's where he really started to get into it a bit. So the, the way this, the podcast started, so Joe actually lives in Australia now. He moved out there oh, a number of years ago um, and, and has started his family there. His wife is Australian. She's originally from Australia. And they had been living in the States for a little while. And then because of job opportunities and, and other reasons, um, decided to move back there where her family is. And now they have kids and he's got a job over there and they're pretty well settled. So it looks like, <laughs> looks cool. like he's there, dare to say, at least for a little while. And so we were, I had started really getting into, into a handful of podcasts at the time and thought that with our, our background, we talked about this beforehand, but Joe and I have in the past done a lot of kind of audio stuff. We've done, we had a band in high school and, and into college. We did some recording, did some sound recording with that. So we had that kind of skill set to put together the kind of audio production that you need to do for a podcast. And so it seemed like a natural project for us to take on that, that it's something that we could do while we are living so far apart to keep connected. I don't, I don't know if you mentioned it, but we're actually identical twin brothers. <laughs> so we were, we were very close growing up. We always had something we were, we were working on growing up. So this seemed like a good way for us to kind of reconnect and keep these conversations going. And especially to dig into these ideas of libertarianism that we had both become interested in. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. For, for me, I just go real quick. My, um, you know, I, I didn't really care about politics at all growing up. I was completely indifferent. And I actually voted for Obama in 2008, um, not because I cared about Obama, but because my mother's a Democrat and, I, and she yeah. wanted me to vote. So I said, who should I vote for? She's like, Obama. So I said, okay, I'll vote for Obama. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, I really got into it. And, and uh, you know, creatures from Jekyll Island, Stefan Molyneux, uh, mm-hmm. Larkin Rose, you know, reading a bunch of books, listening to podcasts, LouRockwell.com. And, uh, and yeah. so, yeah, and, and actually with me. Um, my wife actually cr- takes a lot of credit because she says that she introduced me to a Stefan Molyneux video on on spanking, corporal punishment, mm. and and that's what got me going down the rabbit hole with him and checking out his other videos. Uh, she's yeah, like, without yeah. me, you wouldn't be anywhere. <laughs> you wouldn't <know> any <laughs> <You're stuff>. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so she takes all the credit. Doesn't matter how much I write, how many videos I do, how many interviews I do. <laughs> without me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's hard it's rough uh, <laughs> but um but yeah that's uh that, that's a really awesome story um yeah i love i love hearing everybody's unique journey you know it's just it's just yeah, amazing yeah. Uh, and ron paul did so much in terms of transitioning people to becoming anarchists and voluntarists because and even even though you know he he was a politician <laughs> mm-hmm. but he kind of i think later in an interview he kind of said, you know, yeah, anarchism is cool. You know, it's uh, yeah, know, just yeah. as long as you don't hurt anybody, you know, you're not initiating force. <laughs> it's awesome, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Right? He was, uh, I mean, 
I don't know how he was able to be as successful as he was as a politician for as long as he was. He was right. kind of the the exception that proved the rule, you know, that <laughs> yeah. that there can be, you know, got a good principled politicians out there. You know, he he was the one that kind of showed that that's actually possible. But right. he's, of course, the only one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are saying that Trump is the next Ron Paul. Like he's the next, you know guy to try to shrink government but i don't oh, know i don't know that's uh that's uh yeah that's, <laughs> that's some a big shoot that's a crap shoot there yeah, yeah if you're, no, no. you're uh <laughs> hooking your car to that horse huh? I, I wouldn't i wouldn't put much hope in that but uh but yeah, yeah, please, yeah please um yeah get into maybe a little bit we were talking about you know the idea of privatize well you know first of all i just want to say that when i heard what you guys the way you guys uh, did the scales model of how we live you know you know mm-hmm. your room and then your your property and then your the neighborhood, you know, and, and I was explaining that. I was so excited, like thinking about them, like that's cool. I never, I never thought of it like that. I mean, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but I just never thought of it like that. And I told my wife, and she was, mm. I'm, I'm telling you, she was unimpressed. <laughs> yeah, I told her, I'm like this is so cool. My, my is. wife has been unimpressed with the podcast so far too. Yeah, <laughs> what is it with unimpressed wives, right? <laughs> so, I keep telling her, honey, you're not our our targeted demographic here. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, and, and I was saying this is so cool. You can look at it through scales of time and scales of the built environment, and there's all these different layers. And she's like, "I, I know that. I know it's obvious. I know." I'm like, "It I is, know. it is." Yeah, we, we said that. I think in the front, we're like, "Look at some of the stuff." Yeah, of course. Like, we you know what a house is. Like, we don't need to explain this to you. But, but then from there, we go on to explain more. Yeah, we use that. We create that framework, and then in the next two episodes, we use that to explain. Again, these ideas of how how government impacts yes. the development at each of those scales, yeah. and then in, in the following episode, in episode three, how we can start to develop some anarchic approaches, more non governmental solutions to providing the same kind of services that people re- now rely on the government for. Yeah, yeah, like like what fascinated me about it is how you were saying there is different levels of conflict at each stage. Right, the, the mm-hmm. conflict that you would have at your property level is different from the conflict you would have in the neighborhood level, as the city right. level, and the metropolis level. You know, there's different levels of conflict. I thought that was fascinating, mm-hmm. and, and how the state involves itself in each level, and how you can, how we can find private solutions. Like, you know, if your neighbors, like, you, you, I think you mentioned on one one of the podcasts that if your neighbor is being too loud, or there's a house party. You know, you can call the cops. Right. Or you can just go over there and talk to them <laughs> like a decent right. human being <laughs> and come to right. an agreement, you know, like, like there, right. are, there are nonviolent ways to solve these problems without invoking, you know, the law enforcement uh, attack dogs. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I think one of the one point we made related to that was that you t- what you tend to see is that at these smaller scales of, you know, dealing with your neighbors, most people, their first, well, I don't know so much. It depends on the person, I guess, but <laughs> often people are willing to go in and talk to their neighbors before they start to bring in any kind of legal or governmental consequences to some kind of whatever conflict there is. But as you start to go up that ladder to, you know, to the scale of a city or certainly, you know, a region or a nation, the government response becomes kind of their immediate response, right? It's that their their first question is, well, what's government doing about this? You know, whereas if you're just talking about some conflict with your neighbor, mm. that's not going to be your first. That's not the way that people interact on a normal basis. But when you start to group people together into these territorial monopolies of of governments, then um, it kind of pits everybody against each other. And I think people start to just look towards that that kind of parent figure of the government to solve all of their all of their issues rather than trying to explore ways to to resolve them without that intervention. Have you read that book, um, The Market for Liberty by Linda and Morris Tannehill? Um, I, uh, I I listened to I don't remember if I finished, but I had listened to a, a, um, a good chunk of it at one point. Uh, the, the audio record. I think Ian from Free Talk Live had done a yeah, a, uh, yeah that. This was years ago, but when I went back when I used to listen to those guys a lot, he okay. had done a uh, an audio recording of it. And I'd listened to, um, I'm gonna listen to the whole thing. I don't remember, but it was, it was some time ago. But yeah, yeah. I, but I, yeah, they get into some of the. It's really this kind of tactical approach to. Okay, so how do we actually? How does it actually work in this mm-hmm. kind of society? How do we actually do these things? Yeah, yeah, like like I, I've read a lot of books in my life, and there's very few books I've read more than once, and. Uh-huh. Um, 
you know, because it has to be a really, really good book for me to read it more than once, right? Yeah. And, but The Market for Liberty was one of those books. So, I'm like, I, I, I got to read this again. <laughs> and, it, it, yeah, it's, it's really an amazing book written in the 70s, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very early on the, you know, what's, what's now become this kind of movement of right. anarchism, libertarianism, you know, anarcho-capitalism. It was, it was really kind of forward looking. Yeah. Um, you know, I, they, I don't think they got everything right, but it was really kind of creative in the way that they started thinking through some of these problems. Yeah, yeah. Really, really amazing, you know, speculation as to how a stateless yeah. society could um, do, you know, national defense. Like, like what you said, when people think of on the scale of the the region, the geographical region of like, you know, North mm-hmm. America, you know, first thing would come to mind would be like, what about national defense? How are you going to defend? How is the free right. market going to do national defense? And, and in that book, they kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, and, 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 and you know, it's the thing that I always tell people is that your solution at the geographical level, it has to make sense if you reduce it down to the individual level, because if, yeah. if it doesn't, then you're just you're not solving any problems, most likely making more problems. So, right. you know, if you're saying our excuse for taxation is because we need national defense, but, you know, you, you and I think it's an Ayn Rand quote, which is, um, you know, the sm- smallest minority is the individual. So if you, if you don't advocate for individual rights, you can't advocate, you're not advocating for minority rights at all, mm-hmm. <laughs> at all something mm-hmm. like that. So that, to me, that applies to national defense in that, you know, if, <laughs> it's like you know are you really saying we need to steal from people to defend other pe- from us from other people like that doesn't make sense <laughs> doesn't matter how big it is you know so um yeah so i, I thought that was really yeah i mean the the I, I think the cheap shot comment you can make there well is that you know if we don't have a nation then we don't need to have national defense <laughs> you know if you're in, in some sense kind of grouping people together into a nation a state whatever it puts a target on you, right? Then, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, and especially in a democratic nation, if everybody's working off of the pretense that the people, you know, the citizens are controlling the government, then in order to change that government, for if, if I'm an attacking nation or an you know, attacking agent, you would think that, or you would think that they might think that it should be fair game to attack the citizenry, because after all, the citizenry is in charge of the government, right? And to some extent, I, I think that's, I don't want to say it's true, but I think that there's a problem with saying that we're all in this democratic society where we choose our leaders and the leaders act according to our will, but then saying that, well, if people are attacking us because of some action that the government is doing, you know, that they shouldn't attack civilians, you know? mm. but, but it, it's, and this isn't, I don't think this is coming out quite right. It sounds like I'm, I'm blaming the victim here and you know, blaming the civilians, <laughs> but, but I, I think the point is again, that, that it, it kind of puts a target on everybody within a nation as part of that nation, you know, in nine 11, they didn't attack, well, they did attack Washington DC, but they didn't just attack Washington DC. They attacked New York city, which has nothing to do with the national government, mm. but that was what they saw as a pressure point for the nation mm. because, you know, we're all we're all in this together, right? And under under the government. So when you start to break that down and break apart those national uh, associations, it starts to become a lot less clear of who an attacker would be attacking and what there is to gain by that. You know, if instead of the single nation of America, there are 10,000 cities in America you know, and I'm coming into, I'm Canada coming in to invade the United States. It's like, where do I start? <laughs> you know, right. just taking over one city over here doesn't get you the rest of, right. uh, exactly. of the country. There's- yeah. So the way I look at that is that as long as people believe that the ruling class is legitimate and that they should pay their taxes and it's their civic duty as a citizen, then that would incentivize another nation state to invade and control and subjugate the tax base, right? The citizenry. Right. And then they would just asa- establish themselves as a new ruling class <laughs> because from the perspective right. of the citizen, who cares who's in charge? <laughs> you got to pay taxes anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so, so the idea is the, the whole linchpin of how that, that situation only works in, in statism is because they believe that a ruling class is legitimate, right? So if you have, like you just said, if you have multiple factions of people that understand you know, they could understand self-ownership property rights, but the, at the very least, they don't believe that a ruler is legitimate over their lives. Then how are you going to subjugate them? Because they're never going to believe you're legitimate. <laughs> you right. Know? It's right. like, I mean, I, the way I look at that is like how unsuccessful the most powerful military in the world, the U.S. military, has been in the Middle East, which you would think is like a backward, you know, 
desert, you know, uh, people and, and they haven't really been able to win, you know, the, right. there, there's been so much retaliation, you know, and, and it's kind of like guerrilla warfare, right? So they right. haven't conceded. <laughs> Even well, that's though kind, we're the that's most powerful. Yeah. Right. That's kind of the, the, the inverse of what I, I guess what I just said is that there's no target over there. You know, there's no, right. There's nothing to take over that then, right. that, and not, and again, you know, the U.S. of course, they don't take over. You know, we're going to liberate people, but, but there's, there's no. Um, <laughs> take, I guess, take this democracy. There's, <laughs> I, mean, I guess there's less of a built-in power structure there that can be gained by someone invading. Right. And you know, I think whereas in the U.S. you have the federal government, you have state and local governments, and if someone were to come in and take that over, or you know. <laughs> Some people might even say that Trump has just done this, right? Mm. <laughs> He's just a surgeon who has taken over, you know, the, the, uh -huh. the levers of power of the U.S. government. Uh -huh. But what that gets, you know, somebody who's coming in and invading is, as you said, the tax base. Right. It gets you a military, at least a military structure, assuming that you can maintain that, maintain kind of the allegiances that that, that depends on. Mm. Um, and it also gets you the property, all of the property that that government owns and that that government can utilize, I guess, for its own income and its own its own purposes. I read somewhere recently that in the United States, I, I forget the numbers, but at least over 50 percent of the landmass of the of the United States is owned by governments, you know, mm. state, local and, mm. and, and federal. And in some states, it's as high as, as 70 or 80 or maybe in the 80s percent is owned by government. All right. Need to make a correction here. That number I gave of 50 percent of the landmass of the United States being owned by government was off by a bit. <laughs> I had read it at some point in a Walter Block article, which we'll link to in the show notes. These were numbers from the Property Rights Alliance. I went back and found the article, and I don't know what the current percentage is, but it's somewhere around 38% of the landmass of the U.S. is owned by federal and state governments. Now, as I understand it, that doesn't include local governments, and I'm also not sure if that includes roads and rights of way. So it's possible that that number, if you're including federal, state, and local, um, as well as all the roadways, who knows, maybe that's pushing somewhere closer to 50%. And I should say that most of that land that the federal and state governments own is in western states. So this is like Yellowstone Park and some of these big protected areas in the western parts of the country. You can go online and find maps of this, and we'll, maybe we'll pull one into the show notes. But it is true that in some states that number is as high as 80 or 90%. So there's this, this huge amount of, of property out there that becomes part of the, the basis of government's power, and not just government's power, but, but becomes a kind of a honeypot for anybody who would want to come in and invade and, and take over the country. <laughs> and so I think that that's, that kind of ties into what we're talking about, that if you can start to divest some of that property and start to find ways to privatize that and make it available on more of a voluntary basis, then for one thing, it, it reduces that basis of power for government. And it also it also makes government less necessary, right? Because now government doesn't have to maintain all the roads and all the parks. Mm -hmm. You know, if even for something like a, um, a minarchist, you know, who says, well, government should defend us and should run courts and make laws, you know, mm -hmm. it's fine. And none of that says that you need the government needs to run roads, you know, build roads and, and manage roads. None of that says that government needs to build schools and manage schools. So I think that looking at the built environment as a piece that can be taken away from government is logical. And in fact, that can happen even before you get to some kind of fully realized stateless society. You know, there's, there's no reason why parts of the built environment can't start being privatized today. And in some places, you know, they are that that does happen. So, so please go into a little bit of the idea, you know, that I get confronted with by some Democrats and socialists, which is like, you know, because we have power lines and pipes in the ground, right, to receive water or take away your sewage. You know, we have all this infrastructure and organization. But if you advocate for a stateless society or, or a voluntary society, you're against that. <laughs> you're against structure. You're against organization. And can you go into a little bit of, of how yeah. you see, like, how would there be competing water companies or competing electrical companies like what do we have right. would our roads be you know would there be more power lines there? would there right. be more pipes like how, how would you see that yeah so let's start with power lines that that's probably easy i think an analogy there is something like cable lines right i mean cable lines are provided by by private companies um if you want broadband coming into your house 
Um, when I was in Boston, we had, there were two or three companies that could come and provide cable service to your house. And we actually had two lines coming into our house from the telephone poles out, you know, out, out in front of the house. There were two separate cable lines that came to my house. And every once in a while, depending on the, the deal that was offered, we would switch over from the companies were Comcast and RCN. So we would switch back and forth between the two. And someone would come out to the house and un unscrew the one wire and screw in the other wire. And, <laughs> and that was it. So there's, you look at that and it's, it's pretty obvious how a private company can build this infrastructure. And not only w will they build the infrastructure, but they're begging people to bring the wires to their house, yeah. you know, to plug them in because that's how. And they don't. And it costs nothing. Or might you know, there might be some nominal um, setup fee, hookup fee, a hundred bucks or whatever, uh, to get somebody out to the house to set it up. But they want to get their lines out to as many people as possible because that's how they how they build their business. And with power companies, it can be the same thing. They can certainly run. For one thing, we have an, an existing infrastructure grid. I don't know that you would necessarily have competing wires running everywhere. You know, I don't think you're going to have six different sets of high tension <laughs> power lines running down your street <laughs> to, to give people the option of, of switching from one provider to the other. But even now, in a lot of places, you have the option of choosing different power generators. They all feed into the same grid, but you have the option of going with... I remember, I, I think this was again in Boston, we had the option of going one provider who did more kind of green power generation. So they were relying on wind and solar and hydroelectric and mm -hmm. other means of kind of renewable energy production. And, you know, you paid a little bit more for that, but but that was your choice. Or you could go to the more kind of basic power generation company. And so, so some of those models already exist out there. And even the power lines, in some places they are state utilities, but in, in some places they are they're private companies. And often those are kind of local monopolies in certain areas, whether they're government granted monopolies or just kind of natural monopolies. I think a lot of them are government granted because, or at least de facto government granted, because the government has to give permission for them to run their lines down the government roads. Mm. And so that's that's again another issue with with government roads is that they're then controlling what services get to run down those roads and, and which don't so they're kind of picking and choosing what service providers people can have in, in any given area but so again i think it's possible to think about ways that you can have privatization and competition and it's possible again to have privatization without competition it's not ideal but there are situations like a local um, electricity grid or like um, even a local road network that it might make sense for that to be essentially monopoly organization within that area. It doesn't have to be, but I would imagine that that would be something that would probably develop in, in some areas that I don't think you would necessarily be going from one street to the next, to the next, to the next, and they're all different road ownership companies. I think that's possible, but but I think it's more likely that you would have kind of road management ownership companies that would take over kind of an area of or system of streets um, and manage them together. I think that's going to be the most efficient way for the streets to be maintained. So that's that's a bit of kind of electricity and roads, things like water. It's interesting. Actually, um, we were talking beforehand that I, I recently bought a new house. And in the, the small town that we moved to, we have the, the, the sewer is run by the town, but the water is kind of a separate entity. There's a, a, a water district that serves actually, I think, a couple towns in the area. And I don't know that it's entirely a private self-funded entity or if it gets money from the local governments. But I read something that when this water system was first put in, this is probably back in the early, maybe the early 20th century, that there were a number of homeowners in the town who had, in a sense, collateralized their house or put up their house or the properties as collateral in order to secure debt to fund the development of this, the water mains and the water line um, mm. distribution mm. to all the houses within this small area. And as that system grew, they started extending the pipes out, of course, to to more more distant areas within the town and, and beyond. But there's actually a different, the people who had those original properties pay a different rate for their water, even to today, mm. than the people outside of wherever that circle was drawn, you know, the people who had who had contributed to the original system yeah. because they, they set this thing up where they kind of got grandfathered in because they took the risk up front. They got lower water rates, I guess, in perpetuity. So there, there are interesting ways like that to think about how, how these things can get funded and built in the first place and how they can be owned. You know, that organization, I, I assume, is some kind of trust or corporation. It's non-governmental. To my knowledge, it's non-governmental. And it's it's a group of people who just manage this. They have a board of trustees and they get together and make decisions about how the system should be expanded or, or maintained or managed. And so I think there are models out there for non-governmental development of, of utilities.
Have you heard of the book by uh, Christopher Chase Rachel's A Spontaneous Order? I don't think so. It's A a Spontaneous Order, The Capitalist Case for a Stateless Society. And um, yeah, he really, he goes into all different aspects of uh, how a state, I guess kind of like Margaret for Liberty, you know, all different aspects of a stateless society and how it might work according Mm -hmm. to libertarianism, property rights and things like that. And really fascinating talking about roads and talking about, yeah, the waterways a little bit, talking about court systems and pretty cool arbitration. He kind of reminded me of that. And also, um, you know, when you, you were talking about monopolies, I think a lot of people have this knee jerk reflexive disgust when they hear the word monopoly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, they, from their government school history class, they, you know, you think of the oil trust and the steel trust, right? Of, of the early 20th century and the government went in there and broke up those monopolies and, you know, mm-hmm. we, live, and we live happily ever after. <laughs> and, right. and I think what's important to realize is that um, a natural monopoly could occur if a business is so successful at producing their product at such a low price and such a high quality as to outcompete everyone else. And why would that be a bad thing? You know, the, consu- right. the only the consumer, you know, the consumer is benefiting from that. So why would you want to break that up? If people enjoying it, everyone enjoys it, you know, it's like, you know, I tell people, you know, y- you love your smartphone, right? Steve Jobs got rich off of making awesome uh, electronics, you know, iPads and iPods and all that. And, you know, does that make him an evil person? No, he provided immense value and he benefited the lives of millions of people. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's a monopoly. I mean, I guess he does have some competition from Microsoft. But, but, um, but yeah, so, so I, I've really come to, um, to realize that the word monopoly is it's not really the, the essence of evil of what we're really try, <laughs> trying to convey. It's more, you know, is it a forced state sanctioned monopoly? Right, as decreed by the ultimate monopoly on violence, which is the state. That's to me, that's the ultimate question, right? Because right. if it's a monopoly, like you said, in a small town, let's say you know there's a there's one I don't know power company, and you can say it's kind of a monopoly. But again, they can't force the the people living there to fund them through taxation and punish them if they don't pay. <laughs> they can just right you know? turn off the power. But then you know people then can look to other alternatives, whether it's I mean, if they're really doing bad, then then that creates an opportunity for another service provider right. to come into that town and to to start to offer their system, you know, offer their their own, whether it's even independent transmission lines, which I said is, is probably unlikely, but it's not out of the question. Or even looking to, you know, more decentralized generation and distribution of, of energy where you can have. You know, if, if there's a neighborhood who doesn't like their electricity provider, maybe they build, put in, um, they all put in solar panels or they, you know, do a solar farm somewhere or they could even ostensibly put in their own kind of generation station or, or, or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know that a neighborhood would get together and do that. But mm-hmm. um, but if there's a broad area that's under some kind of monopoly, mm-hmm. um, you can individuals or, or, or smaller groups of people could start to build in their own independent systems outside of that monopoly. And when they start to do that, that I guess the point is that there's always pressure on on a what we call a natural monopoly, you know, mm-hmm. a monopoly that is not supported by the state. Mm hmm. There's always a pressure there for them to perform, and there's always the threat of some competitor coming in and supplanting. Not just a competitor, not just a competing company, but you know, an alternate technology. You know, mm-hmm. rather than if there's a water distribution company that's not serving its clients well, then people might go out and start putting in wells in their on their property. You know, mm-hmm. or rather than if the sewage company isn't working out too well, people can start to put in septic systems. Mm. So there are, there are technological and, uh, you know, there are always alternatives to the kind of infra- infrastructure options that are out there. And that creates a kind of pressure on any um, monopoly agency as well. Yeah. And, and to me, that just illustrates how, you know, technological advancement and, you know, advancement in production and manufacturing and distribution have really made our reliance if we ever had a reliance on the state just made it that much less relevant and makes the state that much more obsolete and and makes the idea of a voluntary society so much more realistic right because the greater technological freedom we have (laughs) you know people can provide for themselves people can create and innovate for themselves you know the idea that we have to steal from the productive people to give to it just doesn't make sense anymore (laughs) (laughs) if it ever makes if it ever made sense um so please i know we're we're coming up on the hour but if you could get into um because this was this was a concern of a lot of kind of democrat socialists in my family because i have a lot of uh 
people who, who like the outdoors, you know, hiking and mountain climbing and going in state parks and, you know, everyone loves yeah. their state. Everyone loves their state park, right? <laughs> so, so here I come, I'm the anarchist, right? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm, they're like, how can you hate parks? What kind of a person are you? <laughs> Don't you like the outdoors? Well, and, and, and right. No so what's going to happen to the parks, right? Who's going to pay for the parks? Right, right. So I come and I well, say, you know, you know, the state is monopoly on violence. I'm like, wait, wait, what do you say? You want to build the condo complexes and malls and all these beautiful states? Is that what you want? <laughs> well, you just in your question there, you just gave the answer, which is that everyone loves parks. Exactly. Right? That's, what, so, I, that's so, what I told them too. <laughs> so, of course, there are people out there who want to have public parks and even you know what are now national parks, large areas of land preserved in their natural state. There are a lot of people out there who want to support that. By privatizing those things, it doesn't mean that they're going to just get sold off for condos, as you right. said. <laughs> um, privatization can mean that, as I said, it gets turned over to, to some kind of a land trust. And that those things can be preserved um, in perpetuity. And I think that the support for that will come from all of these people who want those those assets, those public faces mm-hmm. to be out there. That if you want this network of hiking trails, then I would expect that, especially if you're not being taxed and that you have 50% more of your income back in your pocket, that you would be willing to to support the preservation and the ownership and maintenance of a large public park, of, of public trails. You know, of course, that applies to anything from small city parks to playgrounds to to any any kind of public space. I think that it's possible to conceive of of ownership organizations, and there are plenty of these out there nowadays. I mean, there are plenty of privately owned public parks and public you know, public spaces that may be free, or, or they may charge some nominal fee. Um, of course, even government public parks often charge. We still they fees. still charge. <laughs> it's no big deal, you know. It's, and people pay it because they they value it. Right. Right. Um, the difference with with putting those things onto the market is that the true value of these spaces could be discovered. Mm. So um, when these things become privatized, we, we find out, do people really want all of this, this vast area of land to be preserved? Or, you know, are they willing to carve out a few pieces here and there for development? You know, what, what makes sense? I, as I'm, I'm here in England, um, a big issue over here is, is uh, the housing crisis. There's a housing crisis in London that's kind of front page news that, you know, prices are very high. People are, have to move out of the city. Uh, renters are being kind of kicked out of their apartments. The apartments are being renovated. There's, and, it, you know, it's, it's a real problem. And I, I read an article recently that basically there are these big green belts around a lot of cities in England where they say you can't build in this area. You know, this is all, I mean, you get 15 minutes north of London on a train and you're you're in the middle of sheep pastures. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like you think the economy here was still like like working off the wool trade from like the 13th <laughs> century or something. All it's like I'm, it's like why aren't they building, you right. know, this is close to London on these especially on these transit lines and these right. transit hubs. Actually, one thing that's happening now is that the government is actually looking at the Greenbelt areas as places for development. And so here you have a case where hmm. the government, the great protector of, of these green spaces, now has some other political motive for this space and wants to start to take that away. And I'm not defending this this, this green space idea necessarily, at least not as a, as a government initiative. I think it's a good idea, but I think that can and, and should be done privately again by private right. preservation organizations. And there are some of those in England, like the National Trust and others. But at any rate, I think that there could be private organizations who would be better at preserving open spaces than governments are. All it takes in government is to get somebody into power who has a different you know, motive for this area of land, whatever it is, and that everything changes on a dime. You know, They can turn that over for development. And not only that, but if it's government land, then they control who that land goes to. And they might take it out of public use. They might take mm. that and give it to a private developer. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's, if it's a private organization that has you know, established a deed covenants um, for the land and finds ways of protecting that land, it's going to be a lot harder for that organization who is invested in the use of that land as, as public use to turn that over to private use. Private yeah. Development. Awesome. Awesome. You, know, you also reminded me of another thing that you mentioned in your podcast, which I thought was an interesting idea about how you know, people, one thing they find revolting when, when we talk about privatizing things like parks um, and roads is that, you know, we're going to have to pay for it. Whereas the first number one is you're already, you're, you not only pay for it through taxation, but you also pay tolls and you also <laughs> even pay when you go into state parks, right? But the difference is that, you know, the management would be much more incentivized to take care of it because it's their own private property, right? And also, also the other thing you mentioned in the podcast was that, like, let's say private schools, right? People 
they, you know, they, they don't like the idea of private schools because you have to pay for it, right? So everyone's like, it's free. You know, we got free school. Whereas, of course, you pay for it through your property taxes. So, so everyone's income is already strained as, you know, already. Now, in addition, you see you're saying, okay, now you want to pay for private school. And so if, you, if people stop paying taxes and they get like one third of their income back, then all of a sudden, okay, you know, paying directly for what you want, for the services that you want, makes much more sense you know like (laughs) you know why wouldn't you want to take complete control of your income and just buy the things that you want to buy like wouldn't that be better you know better feedback for the business owner as to what really is a successful business model what people really want right then then paying into this huge pot called taxation or property tax or income tax and and then like like you said whoever's in power they get to choose whatever they want to do with it on an arbitrary basis and and then they're backed up by violence like how people ever consider that to be a good idea right i mean why would you want the organization that you're paying to educate your children deciding whether or not they want to hire more teachers or you know put in a new sewage digester at the sewage treatment plant I mean, that's, <laughs> those should be those should be separate organizations with right. separate expe- expertise and and separate budgets and funding and getting to the the, the point you made about roads about uh, you know why people have this expectation that roads should be free i mean i think that the government provision of free roads has been probably one of the most destructive things that has happened you know, in the last last certainly the last 50 years, if not more, within the built environment in the United States, because it has created a condition where you have all of this uh, suburban sprawl. And I'm not as down on, on suburbs and suburban life as, as some critics are. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to look at suburbanism and what's now exurbanism, people living you know, far outside of cities in these very low density developments. And I think that the roads are a big part of why that has happened that if you didn't have governments providing all these free roads out you know, to everywhere, that it would be a lot more expensive for people to just start building their houses this far apart mm-hmm. from all the other houses, mm-hmm. this far apart from where they work and this mm-hmm. far apart from where they go shopping and, mm-hmm. and everything else. And you would, you would have, I think, a lot more, I think we would have been able to maintain a lot more of not just urban density, but even even like small town density and, and a lot more just generally dense communities where you don't have as much sprawl. And all of the costs, so there are a lot of people have documented a lot of costs associated with sprawl just in maintaining all of these systems, maintaining the roads, the length of roads, you know, the utilities that you have to run to between all these houses that are spread so far apart. And so when we talk about, oh, isn't it great that we have free roads? It's like, well, why do we need so many roads? It's, if you if you weren't if the roads weren't free, I don't think that we would need as many of them because people would choose to live more densely, um, to use, you know, you'd have probably much more successful alternate modes of transportation, whether it's trains, subways, buses, more communal forms of transportation. I think that that those would have been probably a lot more successful in the United States as they are in Europe, and, and Europe is, is suburbanizing as well. But Europe has much more of that model of kind of density than we do. And then another, I mean, another thing to think about, I read an article recently where someone was talking about the impact that the free roads have had on production and, you know, essentially trucking, right? In the United States, we move everything around by truck. And so that's created a a situation where you have factories and things being produced. They can be produced very far away from where they're going because it's pretty cheap to move everything on trucks. And the point, one point this guy was making is that trucks cause like 90% of the maintenance costs on roads, hmm. or at least on highways, are caused by trucks. Really? And yet they're not paying any more than any car hmm. to use those routes. And so we have this essentially free hmm. network of transportation for goods that has created kind of a, a national infrastructure of production, you know, where things are being produced, where they're traveling to and where they're being consumed, where you, ha- you can have central locations of mass production and then things go up from there on trucks to everywhere else. Whereas th- this guy's argument was that if you, I have to look, maybe I'll, I'll send you a link if I can find the article <laughs> again. Yeah. But, but if you, um, if the roads weren't free, if, if you had more dense development, um, we probably would have in the United States developed much more localized uh, modes of, of production with more local transportation rather than big central hubs of production that get uh, distributed through the free road systems out to all the, the cities and suburbs. So I think when, when people talk about, you know, worry about the roads, uh, you know, that we just wouldn't have roads being built, I, I think, you know, well, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Quick edit here, I just wanted to include the, the reference for that article about trucking. The name of this article was The Distorting Effects of Transportation Subsidies. This was from, I believe, 2011. I found it on the Foundation for Economic Education website. And the author is Kevin Carson. 
Kevin Carson's an interesting guy. He self-identifies as, I think, a, a mutualist, which is kind of along the lines of anarcho-syndicalism, which Joe and I pilloried in our episode 10 in a, a comical send-up of our understanding of anarcho-syndicalism. Syndicates! I don't know if he specifically identifies as an anarcho-syndicalist, but my understanding of his ideas of mutualism are in a similar vein. Anyways, what's interesting about him is that he has taken an interest in the Austrian school of economics and anarcho-capitalism, and then some of his points he, I think, sees as kind of a counterpoint to that, or in some sense, some of it, I think, he's trying to synthesize what he sees as some of the, the more valuable insights from the Austrian school with some of his ideas that you might say are more of a left-leaning kind of class struggle kind of thing. So we have some disagreement, but he's an interesting guy to look into. And this article I thought was pretty great. We'll link to that in our show notes. Yeah, you know, that, that reminds me of the idea of the tragedy of the commons. You know, when something is free, everyone just uses it into oblivion, <laughs> just takes advantage of it because right. nobody's, nobody's paying the cost or directly they're not paying the cost. But you also made me remember, I don't know if you saw... There's uh, Prager University, I don't know, they put out some videos on YouTube and one of them was about when they were creating the railroad systems like in the 1800s and there was um, a state-sponsored railroad system that they paid. Yeah. Yeah, have, have you heard about this? The, I, go ahead, I, I might have, but okay. go ahead. Yeah, there's yeah. a state-sponsored one, something like uh -huh. Trans-Pacific or Trans-Union, something like that. And they, they paid according to how many miles they did. So their incentive was to do more miles. <laughs> get hmm. paid okay. more. Yeah. And then at the very same time, there was another uh, railroad company, a private railroad company that was trying to do a similar thing in the northern U.S. And they finished like much quicker, much cheaper, and it was straighter. Whereas if you look at the the, the state sponsored one, they're like loop de loops and <laughs> all these. Yeah, they were, I, I have heard of that. And yeah, I remember they were, they were saying that basically that the the tracks were going around and and in, into and out of all the districts of all the politicians who were supporting <laughs> the, the train network right, throughout the country. So. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's really amazing how businesses respond to these incentives. You know, if you know people ask me, you know, isn't it a horrible thing that these colleges are. And, and universities, their tuitions are just skyrocketing. Isn't it? They're just, they're just greedy, greedy, you know, deans of these colleges just stealing money from people. I'm like, well, you know, if the federal government did not secure uh, income for these universities, they would not be able to do that. Like, if you knew, if you had a business right. and you knew you would get income regardless of how good your product or service would be, what would be your incentive to keep your prices down? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's like, what's the incentive to produce a good quality product at a low price when you're going to get paid anyway? Who cares? You know, so <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they're getting paid. So, <clears throat> yeah. So just these basic things you can apply to all different, you know, sectors of the economy and you can see it played out so many different ways. And, and also the other thing is you're talking about roads. I remember hearing a speech by Walter Block and he said, like the third most common leading cause of death is, is car accidents. And so <laughs> yeah. something like 40,000 to 40,000 people a year are killed in, in auto accidents in the United States. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and how much of that is related to, you know, like, um, you know, traffic lights and how, you know, how, how does that like, I think the most common rear end, uh, rear end collisions occur around traffic lights or, or people who, you know, the, the, the yellow light and then. They don't know if there's a cop, so they slam on the brakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, one other interesting, uh, I guess, point about that is that you, I have to think that if you had roads that were privatized, that were privately owned, again, whether that's by, by a for-profit corporation or some kind of nonprofit trust that, that maybe everybody gets a share in or whatever, you know, within a town, maybe everybody gets a share in the, in the road corporation that, that is, is maintaining the roads in their town. You'd have to think that if these roads are privately owned, that there's going to be much more um, enforcement of safety on those roads because there's going to be more liability right. for those road owners. I mean, the government, if you if you get in a crash on a government road, you know, someone's speeding and they and they drive you off the road. You can't sue the town for, you know, not having a cop on that corner right, um, right. and for not maintaining uh, maintaining safety um, mm -hmm. on the roads. And, of course, people need to be accountable for their own actions, um, the, the individual drivers. But I have to imagine that with private ownerships of road, that you're going to have much more involved safety measures 
here in, in, in England where I am now, they have speed cameras everywhere. I mean, on, on the highways and they hide them. I, I, we, we were walking through this neighborhood and we, there was, we literally saw a speed camera hidden in like a birdhouse up on a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, and, and honestly, and I know a lot of, ter- excuse me, a lot of libertarians have problems with things like speed cameras and, and red light cameras. And, and I understand those problems. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there are ways to make those work. And I think it makes a lot more sense to have cameras all over the place, you know, checking people's speed and not just not just giving people tickets. I mean, that, that does become, I guess, a means of funding the road in some sense. Yeah. But making people know, OK, look, at you're going to go the speed on this road or they're going to be constant. I mean, now nowadays people drive, you know, you drive. Do you ever drive less than 10 mi- miles over the, the speed limit? I mean, it, you know, <laughs> everybody knows that you can drive up to nine miles over the speed limit. Right. And you're never going to get pulled over, even if you see a cop. And most of the time you don't even see a cop. Um, <laughs> and so the way roads, road safety is enforced in the United States is, I think, very poor and I think tragic. Because when you have police who are tasked with catching speeders, catching people running red lights and also, you know, catching murderers and catching going on drug raids and and all this other stuff. I mean, catching speeders is pretty low on their list of responsibilities and priorities. So they don't seem to me to be the best people, you know, not that they can't do the job, but they have a lot of other priorities that rather than um, catching the occasional speeder um, on the highway. I think that with private ownership of roads, there would be a lot more incentives to increase uh, safety measures on the roads that could really have an impact on those 40,000 deaths that happen every year. I think a, a lot of law enforcement officers are preoccupied with discovering if you have the, um, the correct leaf or flower in your pocket. And if you have, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the, <laughs> that's the, it seems like the focus of most of them. Um, yeah. But so many things to discuss and uh, I mean, awesome conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. You know, I, I haven't, uh, delved into these topics with with many other people because you guys said you know you guys have such a unique perspective on it so uh, yes yeah, so that's really awesome but please can you reiterate uh, the ways that people can find you if they want to follow your work sure our podcast is on itunes and stitcher and i'm sure whatever other <laughs> podcatchers are out there mm-hmm. joe's got that got that all set up and, and humming along so um <laughs> you should be able to find us on whatever whatever podcast app you're using just search for an architecture podcast our website is www.anarchitecturepodcast.com. So that's all one word, anarchitecturepodcast.com. Um, on Facebook, I think it's An Architecture Podcast. On Twitter, it's An Architecture P, so An Architecture and the letter P. And I think if you Google An Architecture, I think we, we are now just recently on the, the front page of Google for the word nice. An Architecture. So that's probably the easiest way to, to start. But obviously on our website, you can find all our social media and, and podcast links and find out how to subscribe to the podcast. And I should say that we do, you know, the podcast is our main focus, but we do occasionally write some blog posts and put up some memes and things like that. And, you know, have a lot of fun with it. We're pretty, we're fairly active on Twitter. Not every day, but but we usually find a few articles um, here and there to put up on Twitter that are um, kind of go towards these topics of, of kind of libertarian approaches to development of the built environment. Awesome. And, uh, and one thing I like to ask my guests before we go is, what is your favorite quote of all time? My favorite quote of all time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, um, when I'm, I'm thinking about libertarianism, one I often come back to, I took three years of Latin in high school mm-hmm. and I feel like I need to, I need to use that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, I think my favorite is the Ludwig von Mises, von Mises quote, which is, tu ne sede malice. Hold on, I got I to look at the rest of it. But it's um, it's essentially like, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more more boldly against it. But it sounds better in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Latin version of it. All right, well, wait, look, look up the Latin version and send it to me. I'll put it, yeah. <laughs> I'll put that in the description. Um, right. Oh, yeah. And one thing, actually, before we go, I wanted to ask, you can expand on this a little bit. I thought this was fascinating. In the, um, I think it was episode three, you guys talked, made the um, analogy to the ant colony. And, oh, yeah. and how as that relates to anarchism, because most people look at that society or that organization, uh, 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 you know, uh, colony, and they say, oh, that's a perfect example of central planning. Because yeah. look, there's a queen and there's workers and there's drones and the, everyone has their job. Everyone knows their place. So it's kind of hierarchical. So isn't that, isn't that a, a, a good justification for the hierarchy in our political structure? So, so how would you rectify that. <laughs> that yeah, that assertion. was a, that was a, um, an introduction that Joe had written for our, I think it was episode three. 
he called it ant architecture. I, I loved it. Right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, uh, yeah, the concept was he set up that premise that this is the way people think these ant colonies work. But the reality is that each of these ants is kind of doing their own thing. They are, they're going out, they're finding true, they're coming back and they're leaving pheromones and you know, these pheromone trails and things for other ants to find and then go and find the food or whatever they're looking for. Um, and so it's this system of communication between all the individual ants that allows them to do what they do. And in fact, the, the queen ant doesn't know anything that's happening outside of the, the nest or the ant hill or whatever you call it. Yeah. You know, she just, as Joe said, she just sits there and, and spews out larvae all day long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so she's actually powerless. Yeah. Whereas the workers are the ones going out and are able to, I guess, for them, discover value in the world and bring that back and support the rest of the colony kind of independently. And this, it's just as parallel to, I guess, the, the kind of Hayekian idea of self-organization of society and and the price structure and how, how in, in economics, you know, how in the economy, you have prices being communicated hmm. through the system right. of, of economic production. By individual actors. It's not like there's somebody, at least in, in a free market, there's, there's not somebody at the top of the chain who's dictating what all the prices will be. And that's what the prices, what the prices are. The prices that people, that consumers are willing to pay for something, that information gets fed back to the producers of those final goods. And that gets fed back to the producers of the raw materials for all those goods. And there's this, this coordination that just happens between all of these individual interactions rather than having some kind of overarching control of it. So that was that was kind of the analogy that Joe was making in that piece. And then, of course, he extended that to the built environment and saying that a similar thing often happens in the built environment where you have all these ind individual and independent projects that are being built based on entrepreneurial proposals or entrepreneurial solutions. But, of course, they need to respond to and react to the infrastructure that's around them. And then they, in turn, inform that infrastructure and how that gets developed in the future. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I love that. And, and, um, and also, he mentioned how the, the jobs or the roles of the workers was not rigid. Like, if, depending on if there's an outside attacker, they all defend. Or, yeah. if, or if some of the workers in, in, that were doing something, maybe they die for some reason then some other workers would change their roles to fill in for that as needed. So it was right. really flexible and fluid, right, and adaptable. Right. And, and how that, like you said, it, it, it's analogous to the idea of spontaneous order. You know, there is no central planner, no central authority that's dictating what should happen, and yet things get done and they flourish. Right. And that's an amazing thing, and that's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, <laughs> and the economy works exactly the same way. And, and you know, the amount of political intervention occurring in the economy through regulations, through taxation, through laws, you, it's kind of proportional to the amount of destruction it, that occurs <laughs> to that beautiful system, that latticework of harmony. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Beautiful. I love it. <laughs> and also, I, th I think also beehives probably could be similarly analogous, right? Be yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Right. Community, yeah. So yeah. awesome. Awesome stuff. Uh, Tim, you know what? I can go on and on with you, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Uh, yeah. So maybe we'll have you back on. If you, you know, do some awesome stuff, we'll, uh, we'll have you back on for another interview. I think you got some great information to convey. So, right. um, if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through uh, Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal links are below. That's patreon.com slash peace to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. For interviewing fascinating people like Tim here, if you want to help help me help me do more of it, uh, monetary compensation is always encouraged and appreciated. Right? We are capitalists in the end; we respond to incentives. <laughs> if <laughs> if you like what this content is uh, producing, you like the value, please um, contribute value for value. Right? That's the capitalist way. <laughs> you know, vote with your dollar. It's the only voting I support. Voting with your dollar or voting with your feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, so awesome conversation, Tim. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and thus seeds of liberty.com and the, uh, the conscious resistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.
Morales, said contra Altentio Ito. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.